Hello, and welcome to another segment of Western Wisconsin Journal. I'm Jamie Johnson, the legal and government correspondent. And today, I have a very familiar uh, face, and, and our guest is Dean Knudsen, a state representative from the 30th Assembly District. Dean, welcome to the show. Good to be back with you, Jamie. Well, uh, Dean, um, we have had other candidates on. It's election year. We had Kelly Westland on, and we came real close to filming Sean Duffy. Um, and uh, hopefully the next time he's in town, we'll be able to get that done. We had you on earlier in the year to kind of give us a legislative recap. Uh, you're concluding your second term or fourth year in the legislature. And uh, what I wanted to focus on was the campaign because we've had your opponent on and asked him similar questions about why he's running, what are his major issues. So let's start with the similar questions uh, for you. Um, obviously, you've been in the legislature already two terms. Why are you seeking a third term? I'm excited about running again because Western Wisconsin needs a strong voice in Madison. And I've said that for years, and my predecessor, Kitty Rhodes, talked about it, that it's so easy for them in Madison and in southeastern Wisconsin in particular to just either ignore us or be sort of oblivious to the fact that Western Wisconsin exists and that we're part of Wisconsin. So whoever goes to Madison from this area needs to be ready to really stand up for this part of the state down there and tell them what's going on here, that we're an important part of our state's economy, that we're part of the Twin Cities and yet unique, and that Western Wisconsin's full of opportunity and growth and, and that there's a lot happening here. And we have some special um, considerations. There are border issues, and we've been dealing with things like reciprocity and the income tax, and that's been probably one of my more frustrating things. I would really like to see that get resolved in this next session. That, that's a priority. That's a good goal. Yeah. And so that's, that's really why I want to run. I mean, uh, aside from all the other, you can talk about particular issues, but really it, it, the, the role is to represent this area down in Madison, and then it's, it's also to, to bring back news from Madison and tell people here in the 30th District what's going on down there, because we're also in a kind of a news blackout zone here where you have right. to really work at following uh, what's happening in Madison, unless it's something major enough that it gets on the national news, which that's happened. But yeah, that, that happened, I think, in 2011. Yeah. But um, yes, well, you're reiterating exactly the impetus for this show and the show's predecessor, which was Power News. Um, that was the whole purpose of the show, was to be able to provide a voice and uh, a sounding board for um, Western Wisconsin. Well, let's get to then, you know, uh, all politicians like to have a platform and usually three or four bullet points, maybe only two, but what would you say are your issues that you're promoting? So the number one thing on my agenda is that we have to have a stronger economic climate so that we have more jobs. And we've been saying that and it hasn't changed. That is the focus. That's what people want to see happen. We've made a lot of progress. I think we've got the state headed in the right direction, but it's not enough. We're not where we should be or where we want to be. And we still have significant challenges there. Um, so more jobs is number one. Number two, from the time I first got involved in running for elected office and I ran for the city council, I ran on the platform of that I'll protect the taxpayer, that I'll stand right. up for the taxpayer, and that I really think that we can be more efficient, that government ought to be limited, and that when you combine those two things, limited government and trying to be efficient, there ought to be a way that you can lower taxes. And I found that that was the case in local government. We did it every time I was involved. Went to Madison. I've been involved in two budgets now, and we've reduced taxes both of those two terms uh, in the first term and then significantly now in the second term. And um, so lower taxes. And the third thing is education. We spend half of our state budget on education. It is our number one spending priority in the state. And I know you're a school board member, so you're not telling you anything that you don't know, is that we need to support education, our K-12 system, 
the technical colleges and the university system, and that's going to be a challenge, and I've spent a lot of time on that. It's a passion of mine, and, and, it, and there are a number of ways that I think we can, can work to continue to make progress there. So that's really the three points. They okay. haven't changed. I think if you choose the right things to focus on and continue to focus on them, they don't change as polling changes. They don't change as the various elections come and go or the various opponents come and go. That I mean, those should be the priorities. They've been my priorities now each time I ran for this job. And You know, I love election time. It's okay. fun. And this time of year, I'm out there knocking on doors, probably a couple hundred doors a day. Um, you have a, a, you know, typically you watch the candidates. We lose weight if you're actually out there knocking on doors. I, I because, remember those days. You know, you know how it is. Yes. I mean, typically it doesn't matter where you're at. I mean, most of us will lose 15 pounds pretty quickly just because there's so much exercise involved in going and having what I call the interview process. It's mm -hmm. like I'm reapplying for this job. And my boss in this job is the people of the 30th Assembly District, and I have to convince them that, you know, I'm the right one to, to rehire. And in the process, we knock on a lot of doors. You know, we end up with kind of a permanent callus on right. your knuckles from, uh, from all that door knocking. But in that process, you get to hear from people, and you hear what's important to them. So what are you hearing? What are you hearing? Uh, Everybody wants the economy to be better. I mean, there is a sense that we've turned a corner and that we're headed in the right direction, but that it's not where it should be. And I think that numbers and statistics will, will support that idea. And that's, that's definitely, definitely what's on the minds of people more than anything else, probably more than any social issue. I hardly ever have anyone bring up one of the social issues. It's always about the economy. And, um, you know, in our area, we've got low unemployment now. Our un unemployment rate, the official rate, is down at 4.2% or something, significantly lower than the rest of the state and, and lower than the rest of the country. But um, there's just a sense it could be a lot better, that you know we're starting to turn the corner, there, there are more jobs, but we can do more. And we continue to lose businesses to other states. And it happened again here just, just in the last few weeks, we had a large employer in Hudson that is leaving for another state. And this has been happening over a number of years. And you go back to when I first ran in 2010, I told the story about, sure, there's a national recession. But over a three-year period during Governor Doyle's second term, we lost more employers in Wisconsin than all our neighboring states, more than Minnesota, more than Iowa, more than Illinois, more than Michigan, more than all of them combined. We had employers that were closing their doors and moving to other states or just closing. And when you have that happen on that scale, you don't come back out of that as quickly as those other states that didn't have that loss of employers. This has been our challenge. So we've made a lot of progress. I mean, when you look at the surveys of what the business CEOs and owners, they now, 95% of them feel like we're headed in the right direction and they're feeling more confident to invest in Wisconsin. Okay, well, your first one, you mentioned jobs always being number one. Can we one. just talk about jobs the whole time? Because yeah, that's, well, that's really what it ought to be about. All right, well, your opponent, that's what he put as his first one too. So uh, there's agreement there. He also mentioned uh, infrastructure. I think it might've been as part of that number one. Um, and getting the proper support for the economy. And one of the things was infrastructure, and he talked about higher speed internet and broadband availability. Sure. Um, so can you talk a little bit about, uh, do you disagree? Do you see that any progress could be made in those regards, or what progress has been made? I absolutely do. I mean, I think when we talk about infrastructure, the first thing that we should be focused on is probably transportation infrastructure. And there are some real challenges there. We've, again, we've been working on that. Um, if you go back a few years, the, the practice had evolved, a uh, different administration of taking money, gas tax money, and instead of using that on roads, using that to pay for other things. Right. And um, we stopped that practice. We um, now 
the voters will be voting soon on whether we should have a segregated, you know, to protect those funds like the gas tax money is supposed to go into right. roads. Uh, highway. Would you support that? Absolutely. I've okay. voted for it twice and, and um, I'll, I'll vote for it again and pretty soon everyone will have a chance to vote for it. But that's not enough because our gas tax also, the revenues there are going down. And so this becomes a big, a big challenge. This will be an issue in the coming session. Yeah. And um, so here's what it is. Cars are more fuel efficient. People are driving fewer miles because, I mean, we're, we're just... Gas is not three so and a half dollars ago, a bit. You yeah, remember yeah. that when President Obama was elected, gas was well under $2. And he had promised that gas should be a lot closer to $4. That was what he said back when he was running in, in 2008, that really gas should be closer to $4. I don't think people took him seriously, but now it is close to $4. And people respond to incentives and disincentives. They're driving a lot less as a consequence. But we've got a system of gas tax uh, scheme, if you will, that's based on cents per gallon and that means that everywhere across the country states are trying and, the, and the, the federal government has a federal gas tax numbers aren't what they used to be so what do you do well what we've done in wisconsin and we've we've reversed the flow instead of stealing gas tax money out and spending it on other things we've actually been supplementing in from the general fund into the transportation fund. To okay, so building highways, that's one for huge, infrastructure. Huge, and there will be a lot of proposals from, from, from toll roads, which, you know, in, 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 in just a philosophical basis, I wouldn't be opposed to. It might be a good kind of a user fee-based system, but my fear is that they're gonna decide that the easiest road to toll is I-94 through St. Croix County and try to get money from Minnesotans just the way they do down in Illinois, they toll those first few roads and try to get money from uh, Wisconsinites. And that would be bad for our area if we suddenly had to pay tolls every day when we went back and forth to work. So I, get, I would be opposed to that, and that can't happen in the short term. There will be definitely a proposal to raise the gas tax, and I've really worried about that. I mean, it's very regressive, P the people that... Uh, but it goes back to the user fee mentality, though. The people it who does. are driving end up paying more for the roads. Right. But the other thing is somebody that's driving a Prius pays exactly the same vehicle registration fee in St. Croix County, $85 a year. It doesn't matter whether you've got a 10-mile-per-gallon car that weighs 3,500 pounds and really wears and tears on the roads um, or another vehicle, and then you've got the Prius where they don't pay any gas tax or hardly any. And where's the fairness in that? So, I mean, I, our system has become very regressive. People that can afford to buy a more fuel-efficient car are actually paying less. And the, and the lower-income people that are driving the car they've had for years because they can't, in their family budget, find a way to get something more efficient, they're stuck paying more every time they go to the pump. And if we raise that gas tax, it becomes even more regressive. And I just don't think that's right. So we've got to get creative there. Broadband internet, sure, that's the, that's the infrastructure of the future. And, and it should be available. In the 30th district, it's pretty good. Our weak spot used to be Troy Township. And um, now they came in, Baldwin Telecom provided them with uh, fiber, and fiber optics and really high speed. They have lots of hills and valleys and, and it was very difficult. Um, so they got a federal grant through the um, stimulus money to do that. Um, and pretty well everywhere else, you know, there's dial-up that's gotten better. For example, up in the New Richmond area, there's Frontier has, has, has dial-up that's, you know, I mean it's DSL speeds. It's not, not really true broadband the way that a lot of us would like it to be. But it's gotten better. What's the proper role of government? I always use sort of the Yellow Pages test. If you can op open up the Yellow Pages and there's two or three companies that are providing a service, then I would say to you, well, why does government, government need to be involved there? They probably don't. What we need to do is try to reduce barriers and regulations and try to let competition in the free market come in there and to provide those services. 
Unfortunately, in broadband, we've got a little bit of that old monopoly mindset that, you know, remember the days when there was one telephone company and you had to call them and they came and installed your phone and they fixed the lines and there was no competition and, right. you, know, and inter, you know, you made a long distance. The good call. old days. The good old days weren't really that good, right? Not when it came to this. Imagine if the government had been involved in the cell phone industry instead of just letting them fight it out. Look at what competition has done in the area of the cell phone industry. Now we're with broadband and you know it's it's sort of stuck in between. In a lot of places you, there's pretty high speed wireless available and that might be a good solution in some of those areas where it's so expensive you live two miles from the nearest really high speed line. Who's going to pay for that wire? Mm -hmm. And your monthly bill wouldn't pay for running that wire to you if you had it for 30 years it wouldn't pay for it and you know so then should your neighbor down the road pay for that Have well isn't that go back to personal choices too if you want to live out in a remote r rural area you have to sacrifice maybe some amenities in parts of northwest wisconsin not so much in the 30th district mm -hmm. but there are much more rural parts of, of northwestern Wisconsin. I'm a state representative. So when I go to Madison, you know, that means, sure, I'm representing my constituents, mm -hmm. but I actually represent the whole state. And as I said, leading off, northwestern Wisconsin needs strong voices down in Madison. So I do advocate for those people that are in even more rural areas than St. Croix County, and there's plenty of them. I mean, you could go right. up to Washburn and Iron County and you know up to Ashland and so on where they've really got challenges with this and you know we need to try to be supportive of those companies that would like to 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 meet the needs of those customers in a way that they can make money doing it and um, and they're they're trying they made a lot of progress I think we need to be supportive of it. But it's not a place where there will be a government solution for that. I mean, if you look at what happened down in Troy, the Obama plan for Troy Township was to spend $5,000 per home in order to bring them high speed. If we did that for the whole state of Wisconsin alone, it would, well, it would further add to the federal budget deficit, right? right. And so at their, at their level, they or don't the seem to the care. State yeah. At the state level, if we did that, we would be reducing spending in some other area because that's how budgeting works. If you're going to make it should big, work, right? Should work. So, all right, let's uh, lower taxes. Kind of self-explanatory, and I don't know many people who are opposed to, to lower taxes. Uh, Most people scoff and say it can't be done. That's that's the most common response: is well, mm -hmm. you can't. That can't be done. Or, back in 2010, I had people that said to me, well, how can you have more jobs and lower taxes? Don't you need to spend money? Doesn't the government create jobs? And my answer was, no, you must understand, really, private enterprise in our system, businesses, people that are starting a business, sure. risking it all, hiring people to work with them because they've got enough business now that they need more help. I mean, that's really where it needs to come from. And if we stick to our um, principles of, of respecting our, our capitalist system that's made us mm -hmm. the most prosperous country in the history of the world. If we stick to that, that that idea that, that uh, free enterprise will provide, we will see that there will be more and more jobs. And you can see it in states right now that have had a different tax structure than our own, that you know, we're, we've got businesses leaving to go there and meanwhile, they're doing quite well. So we're, we're not competing effectively against other states, not to mention the rest of the world. I mean, you take what's going on right now where Burger King's going to buy or merge with a company from Canada. Why? Because our corporate tax rate is so high, it's the highest in the world by far, that these companies uh, find that they're just at a tremendous competitive disadvantage. Well, that's a federal issue. But here in, at the state level, we've got the same kind of thing going on. We've got to be competitive. And um, I think we've made progress there. There's more to be done. Well, when it comes to the lower taxes, um, because you can do a tax cut, and in this last one, I don't know if it was $47 to the average household, this income tax cut that's been touted, 
Now, wouldn't that $47, I mean, if there's, I'm sure some families where an extra $4 a month would, would help them, but um, what about smoothing out those economic cycles and you know, having a reserve fund? I've heard some people talking about that. We talked a little bit off camera about the Wisconsin Taxpayer Alliance uh, um, leader gave a talk regarding that. Right. And um, so what is your response to that? Do you think that we have the adequate reserve fund because every year we get a couple ticks in the economy and all of a sudden we've got projected deficits of 900 million or we get a surplus of a couple hundred million and then all of a sudden they want to give the candy and do a tax cut because it's projected to be more revenue. So we had a huge budget deficit, made tough choices, got our house in order, and now our spending side was a little bit more under control. The economy started doing better, and now our revenue side is going up, so now we've got surplus, and we had surpluses. That's a brief history of the last four years in Wisconsin. What about the rainy day fund, which was established years and years ago and never really utilized? Right. No money was in there. When the rainy day came, and it was actually pouring in Wisconsin, and if we'd have had some money, that would have been great. Governor Doyle, the cupboard was bare. I mean, nothing had been put away during any of those good years. If you go back to Tommy Thompson, Governor McCallum, and then into Doyle, and there were some decent years in the beginning of the Doyle, you know, the first term, the economy was going along pretty well. Nothing was put in the rainy day fund. Literally nothing. I mean, when we, when we hit the recession, we had like a buck 52 in there, and, and I'm being a little facetious, but, but honestly, there was almost nothing in there. Now we've, we've got the highest balance in there ever. We've, we've, we've put in, I think the number is something like 100 times what has ever been in there before. And so that's good if you believe in a rainy day fund. Frankly, I think rainy day funds are a little bit overrated because what often happens and what can happen, and this is where I would differ with Todd Berry. I mean, you mentioned Todd Berry from the, from the uh, Wisconsin Tax... Uh, Taxpayer Alliance. Yeah. Taxpayer Alliance. Rainy day funds can end up just being future government spending. It's so like we're, we're, we're going to ensure that this money gets spent. And if you have a conservative mindset, that's not necessarily what you would want to do. For example, if you found out that your son or daughter who's in college that had been begging you for money all the time and saying, I need more money, I need more money, I need more money, actually had been accumulating quite a little nest egg there so that spring break could happen or something else could happen and you know it was sort of like hey and you meanwhile had been really struggling to come up to give that money and we're under the assumption that it was it was really needed you know that that's the problem is that you know the best the best thing would be at every point along the way to try to be as frugal and moderate in our spending as right. we can be and as mindful of the fact that this is someone else's money, they had uses for that money too, and they maybe really struggled to pay that tax bill. And so just because there's an accumulated little pile of money, the problem is someone can spend it on something that never would have happened if they'd have had to go through the real process, the regular process. Mm -hmm. So that's a fear of having it get to be so big. And um, so far we've tried to kind of take a middle road it's huge compared to what it's ever been before. Is it enough to make a dent in a big, huge downturn? I don't know. A light rain, maybe, mm -hmm. right? A little bit of a missed projection, that, yeah. then it would. A major recession again? It's not big enough right now to, to, to deal with that. So we've made progress there. It's, I think it's better. All right, and then final was better education. And I remember you gave a talk at Rotary, I think it's probably been a couple of years ago now, where you talked about how you want to be able to increase uh, the state's portion. Um, at one time, two decades ago, when I first ran, there was talk about a two-thirds, one-third split. Right. That's kind of eroded to where it's, some places it's basically 50-50. But 
um, the thing that you said was you'd like to be able to do that, but the big monster eating up all the tax dollars, available tax dollars, is Medicaid and the fact that we get, what, 30 percent of our population qualified for state assistance mm -hmm. on Badger Care. Right. All right. So um, is that fixed or is that something on your to-do list? This is going to be a big issue again this time, and it always is. You know, what is the proper uh, balance between funding things at the state level, where it's sales tax and income tax money that then is coming back to local schools for education, and what should be on the local property tax? And then remembering that we have as strong a local control in Wisconsin as any state, as any state. Right. We're very unique. We have no state school board. 48 states have a school board. We have you, you guys that are on the local school boards, and we count on you to be good stewards of the dollars that you're given. And um, so what is the balance? The average school district spends $11,000 per, per student, right. give or take a little, but that's, that's about the number. Uh, we have increased the, what we send from the state, a um, couple hundred dollars typically, each year. It used to be $300 for a while, and a lot of districts got used to that $300 number. Now, more recently, it's been lower, and in, back in 2011, it was it actually went down a little bit. But we gave you a lot of flexibilities and ways to do things that yeah. you couldn't do that, for example, for the Hudson School District, just bidding out the insurance probably saved a million dollars a year, so that more than made up for most districts. Um, and you touched on, I think, in a tangential way about the school funding formula. You know, we've had for years a funding formula that is based on property value divided by your number of pupils determines whether you're considered a rich or wealthy district or a poor district. Right. In this case, you're sort of property poor, if you will. But it's assumed that if you have more property tax base that you can tax more locally and be more sort of self-sufficient. So while Governor Thompson set that two-thirds funding for the state and then the locals, that was a statewide aggregate. That was never a promise individually by a school district. There have always been school districts in the state that really get almost no state aid. There are some that get zero state aid. And there are some that are so heavily funded that it's more than 80%. Not too far from here, you'll find some that are well over two-thirds still today. It's just not your school district. Yeah, definitely not in Hudson here. But on the other hand, you have a lot of property tax because we've been successful right. in Hudson at bringing in business and industry, and in the process, no kids come with them, with those businesses, right? They don't have kids playing on the place. Not directly, not directly, but... Indirectly, they bring in families and bring in people who uh, yeah, end up needing services, but that's what you want. That's to have a healthy, growing tax base. And one of the, uh, we had a recent school board meeting, and here in Hudson um, School District, which includes the three townships, the village of North Hudson, and the city, our tax base has grown from 19, in 1991, it was uh, a little over 700 mm -hmm. million to now over 3.5 billion. Right. And so it's gone almost a five-fold increase, but in that same time, our school levy has increased about two and a half times, gone from about 11 and a half right. million to almost about 30 million. So that's where um, you mentioned the frugality, and that's yeah. why our district, school district is one of the more under-levied. What I'd like to see is some kind of formula that rewards frugal districts like ours rather than punishes them because they've been frugal and then they end up getting less aid or because they happen to be favoring uh, increasing their tax base like we have and we get less state aid. I, I think a lot of people would support that. A and back to the funding formula, I think you will see because there's kind of a growing clamor among legislators, among school boards and school administrators to really go in and do a major revision to our school funding formula. Now the challenge to that is that the people that of course are clamoring for that are those that Be feel Be careful like what you wish for, you might get it. Exactly. 
they feel like they're getting the short end of the stick and that there are other districts that are getting a better deal. I mean, I can tell you that Hudson and River Falls and St. Croix Central, I mean, those are the main school districts in the 30th Assembly District. It's pretty likely that were those districts who want to change to get their way, it would be at the cost or detriment of our school districts in the 30th Assembly. Does that mean that a change shouldn't happen? I wouldn't say that. I think that honestly, just from the standpoint of equity, some of the high lakeshore um, vacation home areas, you, you, you go up to say Manaqua, you know, Eagle River, even here you go up a, a little bit further, go up to say Hayward. Frederick, Luck, Hayward, some of those districts, they really get a, a kind of the short end of the stick on funding. To fix it for them, we either need to raise taxes on everyone, and that's what the state superintendent has suggested, is that we should, we should have a significant statewide tax increase so that more money can go to those districts. You wouldn't necessarily get any more in that situation. Because right, we're property rich here. You'd yeah. be held harmless, maybe. Yeah. But you'd be paying more. Right. And, um, but the other way is just go into the funding formula and continue to sort of tweak it and try to make changes so that, um, you know, some of those districts get a little bit more support. Or flexibility. You know, if they could, if they could be, um, if, they, if they could have the flexibility to just really do some things differently, but there are a lot of state mandates that schools are under. So, um, Education is very important, and then we could talk, and we have talked in the past other shows about the uh, university system, technical college system. Um, well, clearly in this last session, and again, I don't want to go back too much because we've already done a segment on what you've done, that clearly there was an effort to advance vocational schools and a lot of work initiatives there. In fact, Hudson School District was a recipient of a grant just the other day. Um, uh, on Wednesday morning, uh, Secretary Newsom from right. the Department of Workforce Development was in town to learn more about how Hudson School District is going to use that grant or has used it, and they've been training uh, certified nursing assistants um, through the summer and, and training the trainers who are going to continue to do that. Right. And we're very excited about in initiatives yeah. that for STEM and for healthcare academies that we're kicking off here at, at our school district. But it's a good example of collaboration between high schools, employers, technical colleges, and we need to kind of break down some of these barriers so that I mean, you can maybe get technical college credits while you're still in high school. This right. is something that Minnesota has been much better at this than we have, and we're trying to we're trying to move in the right direction with that and others. Well, and that's where all three of your uh uh, of your main issues end up being cyclical too because with better education come better jobs and and then you don't when you have more jobs you can get lower taxes to support some of this stuff so um, they kind of feed off each other I want to touch on a couple things okay before uh, first you've been in office now for two terms uh, four years seeking a third term what do you feel like about uh, term limits now that you've been in the legislature? I hear people still t thinking, certainly for the federal Congress, that that would be an awful great solution. But wh what are your thoughts on that for here in Wisconsin? Um, for me, I think I'll have self-imposed term limits because, um, you know, I've always thought that you should, we should have citizen legislators. And that means that you should keep your day job that you should go serve for a time and then you should do something else again and let someone else serve. Um, I did that when I served on the city council after my third term I felt like it was time to let someone else do the job. Uh, I have not supported a formal fixed term limit. A lot of my friends and supporters on the right have, have really, you know, I, I debate this with them but here's my thinking on that. It ends up empowering the bureaucrats. And you know what? The bureaucracy is forever. And it grows and grows and grows. And really, if you look it's at an our institution. It is. It, and it, to be honest with you, it, it started in Wisconsin back in, in, in about 1915 to 1920 with, with um, the idea that 
you would have this standing bureaucracy that the legislators would sort of draft laws that were a general framework and then they'd let the bureaucrats flesh in all the details. And ultimately the bureaucracy grows and grows and grows until you've got not just tens of thousands of state employees but hundred thousand state employees and you know what? They've got, they're going to have a career there. And so when you, when you term limit the legislators you end up with there's such a steep learning curve that they come in and you'll see this on school boards that the administration knows so much more than any elected school board member that if they limited you to a single term or two terms you'd barely be getting to the point that you could challenge the administration and say look I'm your boss I've got a different idea but what new school board member can do that and so that's the problem when you start talking about the Department of Transportation or the, the, the DNR and the right. Department of Administration, you know, is you talk to, for example, in Michigan, one of our neighboring states, and they have term limits, and you talk with them, and they say, you know, mixed results. Um, it puts a lot of pressure on the legislators to sort of get it done because they know they're, they're either they're, going, they're, they're on their way out but it's also very empowering of the bureaucracy. Because um, they can just wait them out. The best thing is an engaged, interested electorate that's paying attention and doing their job because really they are the deciders. You know, when I say I'm, I'm reapplying for this job, I mean, I, I feel like I need to win the job over again, every time, against anyone who wants to challenge it and say, no, I'm a better choice. And the day comes that either I decide that I'm ready to, to, to move on, and you know, my wife originally gave me permission to run for two terms. Okay. So I've, I've already had to You've gotten an extension make a evidently. convincing case to her for a third. All right. Well, part of the reason um, uh, or, or one of the arguments against term limits is um, that harms you in the ability to become a party leader, become influential down there and be able to make changes. It takes some seniority, that learning curve you talked about. And we've seen you in the last uh, term, uh, you know, run for party leadership. Um, is that something that would be a goal of yours in the third, in your third term is to, I, I think there might be an opening in the majority leader. We've seen um, that in the past, the majority leader, Senate, mm -hmm. uh, not Senate, but the assembly speaker, um, in the last couple terms has changed. So is that in the works for you? Continue to seek a party leadership position. Well, in my second term, I was honored to be named to be on the Joint Finance Committee and the legislature's committee, Joint Finance Committee is the most powerful, influential committee that there is. And it's pretty unusual to be named to that in a as a second term. Um, not unheard of, but um, you know, and, I, and, and from that position, I'm really able to advocate for Western Wisconsin in a, in a way that I wouldn't on any other given standing committee. So I had to give up my position on the, on the education committee, for example, in order to do this. And in the same way, you'd have to give that up in order to, to have the majority leader position. I guess I'd never say never because I did try it. Last summer at this time, I was running for a majority leader. You know, our majority leader had, st had stepped down and I was flattered. M many of my colleagues encouraged me to run. Again, um, there were those, including in the press, that said this is um, fairly unheard of. You're in your second term and you're running for majority leader. Um, and I didn't win, uh, however, uh, it was a good experience. I learned a lot. I don't think I'll do it again anytime soon. Okay. You, you like your position on joint finance, though. I like that a lot. It's a natural fit for me. I mean, that, that's what I, I, I care a lot about it. If you, if you go back to what I worked on while I was mayor here in Hudson, and we, we just completely went through the way that we did budgeting, and we bid things out, and we changed the health insurance and saved right. a million dollars a year, and we, we did lots of things. This is the perch from which I can be, be the most able to influence things like tax policy and spending and decisions. And, um, Do you so expect I'm to be reappointed to the joint finance it's if reelected? It's not a guarantee, okay. but, but I would expect. It would be rare not to, I right? would expect I would be. Okay. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and so what would you see, well, uh, as your most rewarding experience on joint finance? What, what's it been? The budget, the, it's, a, it's an intense six month adventure doing the state budget. And I found that very rewarding. I think we, we, um, we did a lot to improve the state of Wisconsin during, during that process. So yeah, I look forward to doing that again. Um, you know, you look at how can you best serve? And I think I'm one who's always adopted the philosophy of if you don't care who gets the credit, if you just sort of work on trying to work with other people and, and make things happen for the best, that uh, opportunities to serve will always come up. And if you're, you know, uh, diligently working and work well with others, then leadership positions like that basically come down to how well can you work with others? How well can you make things happen? And it isn't about being somebody's boss, and a lot of times it's how well can you work with people that have lots of just varying different points of view and, and make it all come together. I think I've been pretty good at that. I've, I've worked well across the aisle. I mean, we had a number of initiatives, um, again this time, where I work closely with, with um, my colleagues. I've got a civil libertarian bent, and so we've got sort of an informal civil liberties caucus that involves um, Republicans and Democrats working together, and, and, and I, I hope that that continues because that's an area that has broken down sort of party lines, if you will. When we started talking about DNA collection on arrest, which I had a real problem with, that that, that should, should be, I, I felt like on Fourth Amendment basis, there should be some controls there until you're convicted of something. Strip searches, some of the no-knock raids that are going on, um, you've got facial recognition technology, driver's license, driver's plate recognition technology, access to your driver's license records for facial recognition, a whole bunch of areas there where we worked in a bipartisan way. And oftentimes we're in the minority, i.e. not the minority party as in, right. but, but still standing up on a matter of principle. Um, and and there, are, there have been other areas. Um, there was a business mandate. Um, uh, and heroin is another one. You know, the, we, we carried our message about what was going on in Hudson to legislators from around the state that really hadn't seen the heroin problem the way that we had seen it and experienced it and, and convinced them that they should support a package of bills that really, I think, is going to help. It's a, it's a, a number of steps in the right direction, um, okay. and we got you know a unanimous vote in the end on that. But when we first started talking about those issues, there were Republicans that didn't really believe that that was a problem, and there were Democrats that didn't really hadn't seen it as a problem. So there's an example where you know it, it's not so much about party; it's just about that you know we've got a story to tell, and here's a problem we'd like to see addressed. Okay. Well, with that, I think we're a little past our time, but we've covered uh, the points that uh, I think uh, we discussed. So um, if there's a question again about your campaign, is there a website that you want to get out there? Sure, deanknutson.com. That's really tough, isn't that's, it? That's the website. And Knutson is spelled? Uh, D-E-A-N-K-N-U-D-S-O-N. All right. Or you can send me email at dean at deanknudson.com or uh, we're on Facebook, Twitter, those kinds of places too. All right, excellent. Well, with that, Good. thanks again thanks for being lot, on Jamie. the show. And thank Always you. a pleasure. I thank you for joining us for another segment of Western Wisconsin Journal.